Okay. Um, so my paper today is called Reflecting on the Discipline, Gender, Leadership and Power in the History of Art. Look around the room. Think about who is present and who is absent. Who is here to engage with today's conference and who is not here? This paper will discuss gender, leadership and power in the discipline of the history of art. However, as I mentioned in my opening, uh, opening remarks, these themes can't be studied in isolation. And it's vital to consider other aspects of identity, such as race and ethnicity, whether someone went to a private school or a state school, to make full sense of how identities interact with power. Now, I'm not immune from this scrutiny myself. As a white middle-class gay man from Scotland, I need to check my own privilege and consider its effect on my education, career, and life opportunities. Does privilege explain why I'm standing here today um, sharing this paper? Whatever our identities, we can all feel out of place in different contexts and in different times. Some men might feel slightly strange going into rooms today in sessions which have lots of uh, female attendees. Now that's not the case for myself, but as with others in the room, I know how it feels to find yourself feeling at risk or out of place. When you overhear a stranger make comments about how they perceive your identity, a muttering of fag, queer, poof, followed by that second of realisation that they are speaking about me. Now these experiences are physical sensations. You tense up, you read your environment. Should I say something or, or would I risk getting punched in the face? According to research by um, Stonewall in 2017, 21% of lesbian, gay, bisexual or trans people have experienced a hate crime in the past 12 months due to their sexual orientation or gender identity. Now for me, this figure alone says a huge amount about how it feels to feel out of place in particular environments. Sexual orientation is an identity characteristic that many people can and often do choose to hide. This isn't always the case with other identities such as gender, race or disability. So what do I want to do with uh, this paper today? I want to do something something different, and apologies to Fern and the rest of the presenters, I'm not going to be analysing images in this paper. Instead, I'm going to be zooming out and um, considering the diversity of the institutional context within which art historians operate. So there's a few examples on the screen there of galleries, museums and university spaces. I will return to this feeling of being out of place and ask whether the history of art and the institutional context of museums and galleries have a diversity problem. This is a first fundamental step in any, pro in any project to challenge sexist or misogynistic representations. Before looking outwards, we must first get our own house in order. And over the next 15 minutes or so, I intend to turn this focus inwards and pose some difficult questions about how leadership and power intersect and are distributed in the discipline of history of art. I'll finish off by asking what next for leader image and how these themes fit in with the themes um, of the overarching project. So um, as I mentioned um, in the opening, opening notes, I work as a researcher, um, as an equality and diversity researcher for an organisation called Advanced HE, formerly known as Equality Challenge Unit. This organisation works to advance equality and diversity in UK universities and colleges in Scotland. Part of this work involves producing annual statistical reports on equality and diversity across UK universities. Um, and data from the 2017 report, so this is from the academic year 2015-16, highlights some of the major equality gaps in the subject area of history under which history of art falls under. So I haven't done the best job here of representing the data, but you can see very broadly that there's there was uh, 3,460 academic staff working in history, that includes history of art, of which 41.2% were female. Um, it, it, it excludes unknowns, so that the other half uh, were men. However, more shockingly, more surprisingly, is that figure on the right there, the 3.9% of academic staff were BME, so that's black and minority ethnic. 
This figure is comparatively quite low compared to other subjects. It's actually the third lowest and only subjects to have lower representations of uh, BME staff are sports science and perhaps unsurprisingly and related to history of art the classics as well at 2.8 percent and just as a benchmark the overall figure for UK academia is 9.1 percent so it is significantly or a lot lower than that proportion. More specifically when we consider the subject of history of art in more detail we see again so, some interesting gaps across different positions of power. So in the academic year 2015-16, and apologies, I didn't actually make a slide for this, so you'll have to listen very closely. There were 620 academic staff, 390 of whom were women, so that's 62.9%, um, compared to 37.1% of men, so an overrepresentation of uh, female uh, academic staff working in the history of art. However, as is the case with the discipline of history, when we climb the ladder and we look at the proportion of professors, we see a different story. So 62.9% academic female histo uh, history of art academics, however, only um, 25 female professors compared to 50 male professors. So that's 35% of um, professors in history of art are female compared to 66% of uh, professors or men. So you can see that, that gender um, imbalance across different areas. The data also shows for history of art, it is rounded data, but it does show that, that there were uh, zero um, academics, who, uh, professors who disclosed as BME during that period. Again, it's rounded, so it might actually be um, up to three, depending on who disclosed. But again, a shocking picture of gaps, particularly in regards to power in history and history of art. Um, so I had a quick look, and for those working on quality and diversity data, it's been quite an exciting week because gender pay gap data um, has had to be submitted as of yesterday. So this is organisations which employ more than 250 staff have to report the gap, so the mean gap between what they pay the male staff, their male staff on average, and their female staff. I pulled up um, three related examples to places where art historians might be working. Um, what's quite interesting you can see there is that um, there were 8 out of 10 organisations paid uh, women uh, on average less than men. In this example you can see that Tate Gallery actually pays female staff slightly more on average than male staff, which was quite interesting to find um, in the mean and median gaps there of King's College and the National Gallery. So the situation um, looking in uh, galleries and museums. I had a quick, a quick look at um, recent research by Arts Council England on their breakdown of staff. So again, they show a slight overrepresentation for BME staff working in the museums, 17% compared to 15% of the working population, and 55% of their staff are female. So again, a slight overrepresentation. However, when we again climb the ladder and look at chief executives, we see an altogether different picture. In this instance, um, this is looking at BME and white for chief executives, um, so 8% um, BME, 75% 75, um, 75 white. So again, that gap does shrink the higher up the ladder that you go. Now the Arts Council are well aware of this issue and they include the statement in their report and just shows actually the deeper the need to go beyond the data and to look at what does this mean on the ground in regards to what's being funded and who's working for us. Also with, um, with this, and also although I work in a quality data, I think it's also important to think about what can data not tell us as well. So my work at Advanced HE shows in generally the diversity picture in the UK, it, it is getting better. There's greater diversity among staff and students in UK universities in terms of recruitment and attainment. There's an increased rollout of equality and diversity initiatives such as name blind assessments and support for inclusive curriculums. And there's also a greater profile of campaigns um, such as those against manuals. So we have an example on the screen there from an applied history conference at Stanford um, from last month. You can see uh, a common theme throughout all the speakers at that conference, but there's a lot of backlash against that on, on Twitter and social media. 
Likewise, um, the Me Too movement has picked up a lot, of, um, a lot of movement in the past few months, in the past few years. And this is really down to the, the voices of a few very brave people who have been willing to speak out and challenge the status quo. So data can present one picture of discipline, but it cannot explain why certain things are a certain way. Aside from legal compliance with the 2010 Equality Act, we need to think why is more equality and diversity actually a good thing for the history of art in universities, museums, and galleries? What is actually wrong with an all-white um, conference panel? Or what is actually wrong with an all-male, all-white professoriate? Um, this is something that the historian uh, Neil Ferguson is maybe asking jokingly, we don't know on April Fool's Day, um, in regards to the backlash against the manuals. So with the next part of this paper, I want to look at the limitations of data and actually the risks that quality data can pose for universities and galleries and museums who may become over-focused on that aspect. So this section I call, Haven't We Done Well? The Threat of Congratulatory Complacency. So as someone who works day-to-day -day in a quality and diversity sector, let me be honest, we spend too much time speaking to the converted. And it will be difficult to make any real progress if the future, if we spend our time uh, congratulating each other on slightly better stats, graphs that look a bit more representative, or numbers that look bad rather than terrible. An over-focus on data risks ignoring the experiences of those from minority backgrounds and who wish to work in disciplines such as history, the history of art. It can also encourage a mindset that fails to address structural issues and the more uncomfortable parts of equality and diversity work. This can sometimes manifest as training, mentorship, or leadership programs that seek to upskill women or minority groups, giving them the keys to access certain areas, disciplines, or ways to climb the ladder. Now, when done badly, these initiatives can normalise the idea that women or people from minority backgrounds lack something that is stopping them from achieving all that they wish to achieve. It places the onus on programme participants to fix themselves rather than change the structures that can, are tempting to engage with. So this um, bolder type of equality diversity work um, goes against what is known as the deficit model. This was recently noted by Frances McDormand during her acceptance speech for Best Actress at this year's Academy Awards. So this is where she mentioned the idea of um, inclusion writers and actually building into your contracts the need to have diversity and making, trying to change structure, approaching it from a different, a different way. Now commenting on the speech the day after, uh, Dr. Doris Ruth Eichhoff made the following observation. So I'll give you a second to read this and just have a think about how it relates to um, equality and diversity work in the sector. So initiatives such as training and leadership programs and mentorship do have a place, and when done well, they can be effective as a way, as a good starting point for action. However, when organizations use diversity training, mentorship programs, or leadership development as quick wins, this can suggest an unwillingness to take action that unsettles structures and reduces the power of the most powerful. Commenting on this idea, the sociologist Sarah Ahmed writes, diversity and research are treated as two different tracks, such as in doing diversity or being diversity, you fall off, you might even be pushed off the research track, the track that leads further up the organization, the track that eases and enables a progression. So this quote does make you think, why is the focus on changing me rather than changing the system in which I operate? Furthermore, why should I give up my time to change something about myself if I am not the problem? Time spent in training, undertaking mentorship work, or trying to learn the rules of the game often come at the expense of time conducting research, writing funding bids, or making yourself more in demand ahead of uh, research assessment or the next round of promotions. As these initiatives are not often targeted men or minority groups, they can, in fact, disadvantage the very people they claim to support. So how does this all relate to the concept and project of uh, leader image? 
Before I conclude, I wish to link these ideas to, um, and challenges to leader image and demonstrate the value of looking inwards in any study of gender, leadership and power. As the saying goes, people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones and we must try to get our own house in order in order to strengthen the argument uh, when looking outwards. Writing this paper, I wondered whether the ability and opportunity to be reflexive is in fact not in itself an expression of privilege. The power to assess what you do and to change your practices without fear of repercussion or exclusion requires you to already hold a position of power. The spaces where art historians work, whether they be galleries, museums or universities, come with their own imbalances of power. And these in turn set the parameters for any investigation. There are undoubtedly limits to everyone's engagements, and I myself will never know what it feels like to be a black woman attending a history of art conference. But looking beyond these experiential borders, being reflexive does help us to consider the particular lenses through which our work takes place. Through an examination of privilege, quality data, and its limitations, as well as deficit approaches to addressing equality challenges, I hope this paper has helped sharpen the fundamentals of leader image and aimed and, um, as we go forward to explore and challenge the representation of gender and digital images of politicians in the UK and across the globe. Thank you.